are listening to Keeping It Real with Janine, your guide to living an authentic, healthy life. I'm your host, Janine Strong, and welcome. Thank you so much for listening. I think you're going to find we're going to have a very fun and enlightening conversation today. And please remember to go to the website, realjanine.com. Remember, Janine is J-A-N-E-A-N, and sign up for our mail list. And you can also download and listen to the podcast from the website. And there are show notes, too. Okay, so our conversation today is with Don Montefusco. She's an award-winning poet, author, public speaker, and writing coach. She inspires clients with a desire to write memoir and tell powerful stories. Her passion and keenest talent is coaching writers on a path of self-discovery by finding their voice in crafting memoirs through a proven process that uses a threefold perspective of truth-telling, emotional healing, and how to write a good story. Don's upcoming Facebook Live program, Write With Me, will start November 1st and run for 30 days. We're going to chat about how you can benefit from this awesome live writing program at the end of our conversation. Her new book, One True Story, Write Your Memoir, Inspire Others, and Leave a Legacy, will be available in December of this year. Hi, Don. How are you doing? I'm great. Hi, Janine. It's so nice to be here. Oh, this is good. I've been wanting to have you on for a long time. So just so our listeners know, in case I slip, I have known you by your nickname, Zigzag. Yes. So, <laughs> <laughs> so it's just it's a little odd for me to call you Don. So if I say Zigzag, people will know why. <laughs> and it's not because of the rolling papers. <laughs> <laughs> why don't you tell people why? It's because I'm a, an introvert that's tenaciously social, which means I zig and I zag. I often like my downtime. I like to be home, very much a homebody. And then every now and again, I just go out and I talk a mile a minute and I dance and people think I'm this extrovert and I'm not. And then I, so that would be my zigging. And then when I go back and retreat for a few weeks or months, it's zagging and it confuses people. So they used to say, oh, She's zigzagging. Now, what is she doing? Is she zigging or zagging this weekend? And it, it really, it, it was just something that took off. And so it's been fun. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I've always loved it. And it certainly uh, makes an impression on people. They, they remember who you are when they hear zigzagging. Yes, totally. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So you are a trained life coach and yes. your specialty is coaching people who want to write memoir. Yes. How about if you start by telling us about your journey and how you came to want to do this? How it, what inspired you? Mm. I love this. You know, I just got a type, an old Smith and Corona typewriter that was gifted <laughs> to me, and it reminded me when I was about six or seven years old. My grandfather had given me a, he gave me a typewriter. When you're little, you don't write great penmanship. You know, <laughs> back in the day when they had penmanship classes. Mm -hmm. So I got really excited because I could type and it would be perfect. And I thought, wow. And in, in my little mind, it meant, oh, my God, I'm a writer because I could type, you know. And so with my little fingers, I typed uh, like a poem, something like, you know, the apple fell from the tree. Um, the sky is something I see. Whatever will be, will be, you know, something's really <laughs> simple. And I ripped it out and I ran over to my mom and said, mommy, mommy, I'm a writer. Look. And so they encouraged me to tell stories and write because I just like to perform and I liked to draw upon short stories of what was going on in my life. And as a child, you can only imagine it was silly and fun. Mm -hmm. And then I became a writer and I, you know, went to NYU and I got my MFA in writing and I thought that I was going to write fiction. I actually, I don't know, I, I really liked making up stories, studying story, but when they made me cross genre in grad school, I had to take a nonfiction class and I a poetry class. And lo and behold, I was much more successful as a poet mm -hmm. and in nonfiction. And I consider poetry to be partially a short, you know, flash memoir piece. You, you pull on something, you tell a very short story in a short amount of time. And these poems were getting published. None of my short fiction stories got published, but my poems were getting published. Eventually, I uh, came in first place at Wordstock at a poetry competition. And I remember thinking, wow, I guess this is what I'm doing, you know? <laughs> um, and then I'd like to do spoken word and spoken word was another form of oral tradition where you would mostly pull on true events 
um, or true stories in front of a group. And if you could keep the rhythm going, just about everybody would listen. And people were very, very uh, into the, the fact that things were true. So if we, as spoken word poets, would sometimes make something up and then the audience found out later that that was something we just made up, they were very disappointed. They thought, oh, wow, I thought that was something you worked through and that was about you. And not to say that it wasn't a great storytelling adventure, but I realized I really enjoyed it. So I started a writer's group, started teaching writing. And in my personal writer's group, I really helped writers in Portland actually take off. Some of these writers that were in my group have been you know, nominated for the Push Card Award and they did lots of spoken word. And, mm -hmm. and so I was starting to see the healing properties of doing this. I was watching people really heal by calling in very, very tra tragic stories, things that were, were, but they worked through it. And it wasn't just working through it on their own. It was working through it by connecting with people, um, realizing that their story, though their own and 100% unique, also had a connection to the bigger picture. Mm -hmm. Fast forward, I decided to get certified in uh, Erickson has a wonderful coaching program, as you know, mm -hmm. and it's solution focused transformational coaching. And so I decided to go on after being a counselor for at risk youth to work with adults to help them discover their purpose and discover their calling. And the training was great. And on the side, I was still writing. And then uh, it, it hit me when I started studying memoir and understanding what memoir was and started working with my clients on having them write like a short, very short story about something and to understand how if that whatever it was wound didn't happen to them, they wouldn't be where they are today. Mm -hmm. And and there was a, a lot to be gained from these wounds and these uh, situations. And they didn't think it was a big deal, some of them. So, oh, I'm over that, or oh, it's okay. And when we get a little deeper, they would see how writing it down and dissociating from it even, like looking at it as a story, you know, mm -hmm. um, and what, what was gained from the protagonist if, you know, we'd pretend that they didn't write it for, you know, a session. Mm -hmm. So then, so, you know, I kind of was asked this question. I think what really happened is I had a client that, it was actually a client that I was doing. Uh, she was the executive director of the Portland Area Radio Council, and we were doing work for radio and not writing radio commercials, but we were writing big campaigns and putting on big events about sound and, and how sound is your se second best sense next to smell. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, what, is, what does sound mean? What does story mean? What does it mean to hear a story? And a lot of these uh, corporate companies didn't really care. Right. They were just into like, how do we make a buck? But <laughs> she was really into this idea that maybe we could, you know, have like story on the radio, like a 12 mm -hmm. o'clock news program where it's just to connect. It didn't fly. Nobody wanted to do it. But when I was writing with her, she said, you know, you're really great at getting story out of people and having them write it down. So I worked with her. She wrote a few. I worked with another CEO who said, oh, I have a memoir. Can you help me with this? And I said, sure. You know, I help with blocks. That's a lot of what I learned in coach school. Um, get over the fear and this and that. And suddenly I was helping people write these extraordinary books. And um, and they even said, wow, you know, this is something you should do. So one of my clients that I had like a few years ago called me up and said, hey, I don't know where he got this. He goes, rumor has it you're you're helping people write memoir. And I <laughs> really, did you hear that somewhere? He's like, yeah, he goes, would you help me my, write mine? I have an extraordinary story. And I don't, I'd previously helped him with some life coaching. And so he and I started to work together and it has been, I used all my skills from teaching, writing and, in, 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 you know, in college and by nonfiction, like all the studies I've done on how story affects you internally and how, you know, uh, your story will affect someone else's story. You could help someone heal. And I said, okay, let's do this. And it's been a miraculous process to work with him. Um, that has been just nothing short of, of really magic, the way that I can hear from different perspectives. And I help him not only write the actual true story, uh, and I can't tell you exactly what it is, but he's a, it was about his mother, you know, and um, a very unique, very unique mother-son relationship. And so there's the good story. Then there's the emotional component where he was having to process some of these memories that he didn't expect. He didn't expect, mm. he thought it was super easy. I'm pissed at my, <laughs> pissed at my mom. I'm pissed at my mom. I'm going to write this up because 
damn it, people need to know, and I know this is a good story, and the end, you know, and I was like, yeah, that's not going to happen, um, <laughs> so, but I didn't tell him, he even says to me this day, he goes, you knew this was all going to happen, I was like, oh, yeah, I was like, but I couldn't tell you a year ago, when you first started on the journey, you told me no way, I said, I had to just say yes, and then slowly, slowly allow you to have this unfold, and what happened is a very deep healing with a woman, his mother, that he never thought in 50 years um, that he would ever experience that kind of healing, you know? That's amazing. That's pretty and, cool. Yeah. And then I told him he has to keep his anger, just so you know. I said, <laughs> oh, by the way, don't get rid of that that anger, the passion, because that is going to drive the story. But we don't want it to uh, be the only story that you tell, mm -hmm. you know? So mm -hmm. anyway, and then from there, I just started marketing myself. I was working on my memoir. I've been working on my memoir. started working on memoir essays, short memoir to get it published. Um, and I just really, really believe in the power, this incredible power on telling a true story um, about it. An, or, an ordinary person really does have extraordinary stories to tell. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. That is awesome. So Thanks. how, how does, a, what really is a memoir and how, how's it different from like an autobiography? It sounds mm -hmm. like it's kind of the same thing. No. No, 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 no. Oh. Well, you know, back in the heyday of memoir, I mean, or if there was a heyday, because right, right now they call, they're they calling the 21st century the age of memoir, oh. uh, which I find uh, amazing. But back like, oh, you know, when autobiography and memoir used to be an interchangeable uh, word, mm -hmm. uh, but it is no longer. So mm -hmm. autobiography is usually a record of accomplishment. It just, it goes on to, you know, how you d did what you did, who you met along the way. And it's usually for kings, queens, priests, celebrities, uh, politicians. And it's at the end of the life or, you know, t not end of the life, but usually later in life because they're reflecting upon this. Mm -hmm. And and people want to know, right? People right. just want to know. Mm -hmm. Memoir used to be interchangeable with that. But what memoir is, is the ambition of memoir to write a memoir is similar to novel, but it's true, which means it's more of an intimate personal experience. And it uses the tricks of the novel in terms of um, it wants to be more than just a record of the past. It sort of wants to recreate the memories for people to understand what what actually happened. But the beauty of it is it doesn't have to be your whole life. So you could have a memoir on your trip to Greece, mm -hmm. right? Just have a memoir about. Uh, we'll make it. We'll make it cliche here. You, you're <laughs> finding finding your first love, and uh, on this like miraculous traveling through Greece and the synchronicities that led up to it, and it's just this you know kind of an ordinary story maybe in terms of oh you went on vacation you did some hiking you bumped into the sky and you know now you're in love. But when you get to the to the to the nitty gritty of that and all the details in that and you take the reader on a journey, that's a memoir. Now you can have another memoir later. You could have another memoir about how you became a, a, a top chef, you know, and then that memoir might be, you know, titled differently and all about the different restaurants you worked in. And it could have, you know, the drama of the restaurants and the beauty of the food. And, and that's a memoir too. Mm -hmm. So, so mm -hmm. you can write more than one memoir. And now also there's flash memoir. Flash memoir is very short memoir. I would say it's akin to poetry in the sense that some poems are flash memoir, but on a more specific level, a flash memoir piece might be 2,000 words, a wow. short essay about a snippet, a sliver of your life. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. memoir has come into this place of wanting to tell true story. Mm -hmm. Now, not to tell just the facts, mind okay. you. Right. I mean, you must need to have some emotion in there, some, yeah. some, yeah. Uh, uh, I don't know, something to really make it draw you in and I would think that you'd want some of your readers to identify with what you're talking about definitely mm -hmm. so with, with it's great that you said that because in terms of emotion you must have emotion in the memoir because you're connecting with the human condition and the, the big problem that I see when I some well with some people that come to me is they're writing events they're writing great events so I have a, say, um, I have a client's a dentist, and she's had incredible situations um, overseas and in third world countries working on people's mouths, which is, can be very scary, obviously, and very, but, but and, and at the same time, you know, it drives the story, it would drive the story in terms of these 
what is she going to find next in this person's mouth? And how does that, you know, you know, all the things that lead up to these situations. But she's started where she was only talking about the events. She was not in the memoir. So, so it was just a, it was just a few chapters of events. And then I was like, well, the reader wants to connect to you. You know, the, the events are great, you know, are, are really fabulous and crazy and, but there's nothing about her in it. I was like, how do you feel about these things? And she's, she was so used to keeping herself dissociated from it, even though she wasn't ultimately. Um, and then also when I said to her at some point, I said, you know, cause the readers want to root for the hero and the hero is you. And, you know, she said something along the lines of, oh, no, 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 I don't want to be a hero. <laughs> and I was like, I said, well, what is it that, you know, when I say that, what is it that makes you feel that being a hero isn't who you already are? And she says, well, I'm not worthy of being a hero. Mm -hmm. And then I realized it was more of a question of self-worth. Mm -hmm. So until we got through, now I asked her, could I move over for a session or two into my coaching? So, cause she had had this block. She hired me cause she says, you know, everyone tells me I'm a great writer. Um, I've got all these wonderful stories I want to tell, but I'm, I keep falling flat and I don't understand it. I want to work one-on-one -on -one with someone cause I really got to get these stories out. And so once I said, oh, your block is that you're not willing to put you in the story. Mm -hmm. And then, and then because she didn't feel worthy of being a hero. And so while we got deep on what, what, where her block was for feeling worthy to tell her story, feeling worthy to show up in the world as a hero mm -hmm. and that that was okay. It doesn't mean that she's egotistical or self-centered mm -hmm. centered. quite the opposite. It means she's humble enough to stand as an example for someone to understand what it means to embrace your life as a hero and, and go through the hero's journey in each of these times. You know, usually there's like a, a, a period of time, which is why you want to write about it. And you've probably gone through that hero's journey, which is why you want to express it. Um, and once that happened, she was like, wow, that never occurred to me. And honestly, I didn't know. Mm -hmm. I mean, I have to work with a client and ask the questions to see where it goes. Mm -hmm. And so once we did that, we had the truth of her story. It's my three-part process kind of thing. We know the events of the truth telling. We also knew she wanted to tell a great story, but she wasn't willing to get emotional about it and, and, and process those emotions. And when you are able to gently, gently mm -hmm. um, allow for the true emotions to get processed and written about in the midst of the descriptions of the events. And the, it could be funny. It could be sad. Then I teach people how to look at their lives through the hero's journey. And then it becomes so exciting to, to craft a good story in this memoir, you know, mm. for this memoir. So it's, it's, you know, in some ways I educate, I'm still an educator. I'm a teacher. So I, my goal is that I will leave my clients with an uh, incredible skill set of how to tell a good story, um, how to push through writing blocks, and feel the beauty of the result, of the, the beauty of finishing, really. An artist, when, when it, an artist or writer finishes something, that feeling in and of itself is worth everything. It's an investment for the most beautiful feeling ever, mm -hmm. and you get to keep it for the rest of your life and <laughs> show it to people. And that is where we're talking. We're talking about connection. We're talking about example. We're talking about helping, being of service. And so I feel like memoir coaching is, uh, you know, it could be used. It, it, well, first of all, memoir coaching is one of the most fabulous things I've ever done in my life. Mm -hmm. And even if one or two people read that book, that could be all that's necessary. It, you know, some people don't want a bestseller. Mm -hmm. They usually do by the time they get done with the book. But After putting all that effort in. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they usually do. Um, and there's many, 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 many ways to get out there. Like I said, right now is the best time in all of human history that's ever existed to write your book, write your story, because the platforms we have now, we can reach thousands of people, okay, or just a few hundreds of people. But here's the thing. You don't have to go to the library you know, make copies of it like we did when we were younger mm -hmm. um, and then staple it and then hope <laughs> your cousins read it, maybe a teacher, you know, and and then somehow see if it's publishable. I mean, and hope some somebody even finishes it, you know. Mm -hmm. Now we have the ability to throw it up on Kindle. We can do that as a tester to have people read it. 
um, and then eventually make a soft cover out of it for personal publishing, Mm self-publishing. But more than not, memoir is a hot topic right now. You know, you get the right agent. Agents are looking for, you know, quote unquote, ordinary people's extraordinary stories is what I say. Mm -hmm. So just you mentioned Kindle. Is it that easy? Can anybody just put up a book on Kindle? Yeah, anybody can put up a book on Kindle. You don't need an ISBN. You don't need an ISBN number. Um, you can take it down. You can change it. You can re- you can change the content anytime. You can change the cover anytime. You can change the title anytime. You can do whatever you want with it. It's not um, locked. Whereas a, a soft cover, you have to buy an ISBN number. And once that ISBN number is attached to the book, the book stays. You know until you mm-hmm. decide newest ISBN number and make like a second edition or something. But Kindle. It's very simple. And anybody, you know, it tells you that it's not, obviously, they haven't really looked at it. Um, it takes some some skills on formatting the doc, the document mm-hmm. so that it appears properly in Kindle. There's mm-hmm. some there's tech stuff that I know, about, no, I just know of because I'm geeky like that. Mm-hmm. And, and I'll learn it. Um, but you can hire somebody to do that for you for very inexpensive um, once you have the digital copy. Mm-hmm. But the thing about Kindle that you, you know, is there is a science to marketing a Kindle book. There's a science between how you do your market research to see what title is not available because you want something punchy. Mm -hmm. Uh, You can do research to see what's selling in that genre already. So you Mm -hmm. don't necessarily need to add to that genre if it's not a passion project. Mm -hmm. If it's a passion project, you know, where you don't really carry the way if you make a ton of money on it, you can put it up on Kindle and then actually some people have made so many sales on Kindle by posting it on social media, getting friends to read it, you know, and, and really being active that way. And then publishing companies have knocked on authors' doors and said, we'd like to publish a book. Mm-hmm. So publishing companies are looking, for, you know, if it's selling well, if it's a story that's out there that's selling well, you could do that. Um, you could pitch to a publishing company once you've shown that there's some interest. Mm-hmm. You know? mm-hmm. So Kindle is a wonderful platform to play with. And to feel the exposure, right? We talked about it some other time where somebody mentioned it about what's the difference between journal writing and memoir. Was that you? Yeah, I was going to ask you that. Mm -hmm. So the difference between journal writing and memoir is that memoir, you specifically want other people to read. Mm, That's it. That's the only difference. Journaling is purely that you don't ever intend on anyone but your eyes to see. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's the fundamental difference between memoir and journaling. Okay. So they both, uh, both have the component of, of being healing. If you're not yes. just, if you're not just writing the facts. Right. Exactly. If you're just writing the facts, you know, <laughs> I went to the grocery store and I bought some almond milk and I bumped into this guy. I didn't know, knocked all of his, you know, groceries over, uh, was too lazy to pick it up, went to the car and drove home <laughs> and then realized that somehow in the midst of it, his cell phone fell into my grocery bag. And so I had to get it back to him. And then I did. And he he was grateful that I did that. That is the most boring thing ever. You know, did you just make that up? I just made that up. Pretty Pretty darn good. (laughs) But if you say, you know, Oh my gosh, I looked up and there was this amazing looking man. I could see the green of his eyes and I just wasn't paying attention. I was, you know, I was even breathing heavy. I started to think, gosh, how would I ever get to know somebody like this? And lo and behold, I knocked right into him. I was mortified. I couldn't believe it. The last time I saw anything like this was when my Aunt Teresa uh, you know, knocked into the barbecue drunk and all the hot dogs went everywhere. And we didn't let her live that down ever. So I'm so glad this guy doesn't know me and I'll never see him again. And I got out of there from my embarrassment. I didn't even have him pick it up. And I got home and realized his cell phone was in my bag. I have to now find this man and face him, you know, and, and then maybe they fall in love. I mean, who knows, you know, in real life or, or not, you know. Or you are teach. definitely a writer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, it was, so it's really fun to, uh, to, to, you know, to give my clients examples. So, you know, so when they write to me just the facts, and then I ask them questions. I don't say things like, ah, I can't believe you only wrote the facts. You know, that's not a good writing coach. Right. Right. <laughs> I'll say, and I'm, actually, I know, you know so I'll say, oh, wow, what happened? You know, and, I, and I start to ask the questions and they start to remember. And that's what's really, 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 really useful in having a memoir coach mm-hmm. um, is the questions from the coach reading your work will help you dig in deeper to the memories that you totally forgot. Mm-hmm. Um, and 
and and so the story becomes richer and the connections in the story become more obvious and as you know the the the, the subconscious mind is always one step ahead of the writer mm-hmm. the writer's writing from the conscious mind but the subconscious mind is actually preparing the story and writing some of the the connections in the story the subconscious mind is huge in writing i've had clients write a whole chapter and then I'll read it and say, wow, did you mean to make it color coordinated? And they're like, what? And I was like, well, you know, she's in red, you know, the building she works in is red, but then he's always wearing blue and his boat is blue. I was like, was this like some symbolism? And she's like, oh my God, I didn't even notice that. And that happens a lot. The subconscious mind will, will, and then she could use, she actually did wind up using a a, uh, color scheme to drive the story in a fun artsy direction. But, um, but so, you know, having a, a memoir coach also, you know, helps you see these birds view parts of your story and work, work it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, I can see how doing this, especially when you're getting really deep into the how, why, how you're feeling, mm-hmm. what's, you know, the underlying kind of motivations that this could be really healing, even if nobody mm-hmm. read it. Oh, absolutely. The, um, the, the client I have that's writing about his mother and I know he said, you know, like, being general about this is fine. Mm-hmm. He, he, gave me, he gave me permission for that. Is uh, he really, really despised his mother. I mean, mm-hmm. it was an axe to grind. And there was no way he was going to ever admit that he, um, you know, was, was like had compassion for his mother. And eventually by asking questions and I said I wanted him to write something, even if it wasn't included in the book, on how his mother was raised. What mm-hmm. memories does he have about his mother's family? Mm-hmm. And slowly, and or we talked about it a bit, and slowly he started to see that the reason that she was somewhat the way she was is because she was desperate to want to be loved, and her father was really cruel to her. Mm. So her neglect to her boys, because she was focused on the men in her life, mm-hmm. he started to see was her desperately trying to fill a void. So, so through that, when, when that sort of started to hit him, like, wow, my mother really went through a lot and she, she kind of did try her best and, and, and just, just, wow, I don't even know. I've never seen that before. I never thought about her in this light before. And, and I don't even know if I want to, he'll say, I'm, I'm still <laughs> angry. I'm not ready to give her, I'm not ready to be compassionate to her. And I said, okay, okay. But here's the deal. If a reader only reads that you don't like your mom, that's boring. But if a reader reads about how you really, really are angry at your mom and then finds out, oh, wait, the mother who we thought was this horrible character had some of her own wounds that she never could quite get through. And then the reader tugs on that, like, okay, wow, this is a pretty heavy situation. And and some of it's funny and this and that. But lo and behold, when you interject compassion towards the villain, Mm-hmm. It gives the villain a much deeper multi-dimensional self. You start healing because you're now seeing this person who was abusive or neglective in your life as some as a human being who had many, many rough times in their life, and there's a little bit of compassion that comes out. You can maintain the anger and the frustration for the sake of the story that you're writing, but ultimately a forgiveness is needed to letting go because that's the healing journey. Mm-hmm. And he's ready for that journey. So that's another thing. Some wow. people are not, are not. Some people I've worked with very briefly and have said, I mean, truly, they just wanted to write a story with an axe to grind. They were not open at all. I will never love him. I will never forgive him. I will never, 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 never. Like, well, you know, then that's just the story of an angry person angry at somebody else. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So the more that I can get people to start to see the dimensions of their characters, right? Even though it's true, Mm -hmm. it's still a story. Mm -hmm. We call it creative nonfiction. Creative nonfiction just means that, um, say you had an aunt who was a musician Mm -hmm. and she loved to play guitar all the time in really, really annoying places. (laughs) And you wrote her in, at a funeral where she busts out her guitar and you're like, um. <laughs> and then maybe the next day you wrote her in that she busted out at the grocery store when you went shopping with your aunt. Now, maybe those two things happen months or years apart, but for the sake of the story, because we want to get it across and how wacky she is, you know, mm-hmm. you might then write it where within one week she had gone and played guitar at 
various venues that were hilarious, just to give the writer an essence of the wacky character that's this person. Mm -hmm. So creative means it didn't happen exactly that way in that time frame. But the, the fiction is we're trying to uh, blend the memories in order to make a point and speed up the writing so that it's more punchy. It's more active writing. Got it. So anyway, I made that clear so it has me. a so no, I didn't know that. I'm glad you. I'm glad you. Oh yeah. Explained that. So, so basically, the the facts are true. They're, they mm-hmm. happened, but you can kind of mix them up in different ways Absolutely. to make the story more interesting. Totally. And you can name rename people. You can change their sexes. You can give them different careers. I mean, in, in the, the line of memoir, you know, sometimes you just want to, uh, even though people will know it's them, kind of, um, as long as you change enough around. So that's the creative part. Um, then the nonfiction part can still be true. But, you know, if you're writing about an abusive brother, say, mm-hmm. you might make him a train conductor. Uh, a train conductor that moved to Idaho and kept coming back to bug you or whatever he's doing. Um, and, and in actuality, he could be an accountant, you know, working in Seattle. But if you change the, I mean, that might be in too much of an extreme of a change from an accountant to a train conductor. That but, was pretty big. <laughs> yeah. Just to give you an idea of how big you can go if you're really nervous about revealing someone's identity in a memoir, you are allowed to do that. Mm-hmm. Because you want to, you the, some names have been some names and you know events have been changed to protect the you know <laughs> the people innocent. the innocent right yeah um, so there's you know options for that but um and here's the thing memory is only fifty percent uh, accurate if that mm-hmm. my client the one I was talking about he's gone to his sisters and asked about his mom. And they remember the same day and the same event completely different. Mm -hmm. And he's sticking to his guns. And I was like, well, that's your memory. You can stick to it. But if they remember it a little different and he remembers a little different, who's correct, who's wrong, and why does it matter? You know, like, like as long as the essence of his experience gets through, Mm -hmm. um, that's important. Now, if he wants to write in his sister's experience as a, as a kind of a fun playoff on, how he doesn't know if he remembers things properly, that's fine, but it's not necessary because mm-hmm. memory is not, see, there's memory and there's imagination. And to be quite honest, your memory does take on little bits of imagination because you're filling in blanks as you age. So you're not going to remember it exactly. Right. And so you got to trust yourself. You got to trust yourself on moving through it and not worrying about if the shirt was, I mean, literally some people worry about whether the shirt was green or blue or if the, <laughs> the bedroom was, you know, colored a certain way, or if they really did have the, the Chevy, Chevy you know, the Chevrolet truck during that year. And I'm like, it doesn't matter. That's not the issue, you know, make it so, you know, right. um, because the, the main part of the story is what counts. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm. So what if somebody feels like I don't have a story? You know, I don't have, I don't have anything to write. Basically, they just need to talk to me over coffee. And after I listen to their story, I'll tell them their story back to them. And then they'll go, oh my God, I have a story. Because I, I mean, I just have this ear and I, I mean, and I do have the ability. I really connect with people very easily through story. When I ask, start asking them questions, I start asking a lot. People say, God, you ask a lot of questions. And this is just like at the grocery store or getting a hamburger or something like I'll, <laughs> Yeah, it's been a running joke where people are like, how do you connect with people? And I was like, it's mostly, even though I talk a lot, I actually ask lots of questions. And I, um, I, I just genuinely am interested in the details of people's lives. And so if someone says, it's not usually that someone comes to me and says something like, oh, I don't have anything to tell. Because then they wouldn't really be interested in coming to me. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. It's that, that there is something that haunts them. It's something that uh, everyone has this. Some people want to write it and some people don't. So, you know, just because you don't want to write your memoir doesn't mean your stories aren't extraordinary, you know, mm-hmm. uh, but some people are not writers per mm-hmm. se. Mm-hmm. And all a writer is is someone who wants to write and who probably does write, you know, in their journals um, or they write in their head and they think this thought, God, that would make a great story. That's usually the beginning seed of a writer. Um, so if there was a writer, someone who's writing on the side, maybe just journal writing even, and they say, wow, I really want to tell this story. And it sort of haunts them. And people have been telling them, you should write that down. You should write that down. Oh, nobody's going to care. So now they, they start doing that kind of thing. As they get older, because my, my niche is men and women over 40, okay. who have been really sitting on this idea for a while. And now they think 
time's up. I, I, I missed my, my mark. Mm -hmm. And I'm here to tell them, no, this is the perfect time, whether you're 40, 50, 60, or 70. And I work with people in all those decades mm -hmm. and 80. Um, I have a woman who's 82, sharp as a tack. She's a formal high fashion couture model. <laughs> and uh, let me just tell you, her story is phenomenal. And, she, you know, she talks about her grandmother and mother in Italy. And just, it's it's such an amazing, I can't say anything else about it. But when I say that, like, um, it's going to be, I guarantee this is going to be a, a bestseller. And she finally was like, you know, you, I knew it. I knew, she's a writer, but she hadn't told her story. and. I'm so excited that she is. So the idea is that if you have that feeling like nobody cares, now is the time to really understand that people do care. And what the reason they care is reality TV has paved the way for all of us <laughs> to tell our story because um, we don't care anymore that much about celebrities. We want to know what's happening to an like an ordinary family t telling extraordinary stories because we relate because now you're relatable. You're relatable to the majority of the world because you're not famous. Mm -hmm. um, now you get to tell, you know, you get to write down these amazing events in your life or something that really shifted you, something that shifted you so profoundly, it would be a disservice for you not to write that story and get it out there. Because if you have that experience, odds are other people are having similar experience, even though different, right? Everyone's unique. Mm -hmm. completely. Mm -hmm. Your story is 100% unique unto you, but there is a thread of a universal truth in that. And there is someone out there that needs to read your story so that they feel better. Mm -hmm. And and it's, it's sort of, uh, I feel like if you're driven to write your memoir, if you're driven to write your story there's a reason why you have that calling. There's a reason why you're haunted. And it is absolutely something that many, many, many people, hundreds if not thousands of people want to read because you can affect change by, by being an example through telling your story. Mm -hmm. So many people care, you know, and, and the reason that they care is even if you go to some ordinary yoga retreat, as soon as the instructor starts talking about their story on how they got to that place, most of the people in the room could probably relate to some of it. And that's the relatability to what shifts other people. So, so writing it and getting a bigger reach out to tell your story is not just about your healing, but it's about other people's healing too. So people care. Mm -hmm. They really do. Mm -hmm. Well, and when you're saying that, it reminds me of um, so often it, in different situations, we can feel like we're alone. Or, yes. you know, yes. That yes. We're, the, we're the only one. And, and in reality, there's a lot of people going through similar kinds of things all over the place. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Oh, uh, there, there, there was a quote. What did I, I think I sent you a quote? Yes. Yes. Is this the Jean-Luc Godard? Uh, yes. That which is specific is the most universal. Exactly. And that is true. The more private you get, too, the more private, the more specific you get the more universal it gets, hmm. the more people will go, I know what you feel. Yes. Well, my situation was a little different, but yes, I totally get that. It, and you, and I've gotten that on stage. Like when I've done some spoken word poems or I've told stories like at the moth mm -hmm. on stage, um, the more private, the more detail I get, the more I see the nods in the stage. Now they're not having that exact experience. It's my life, mm -hmm. but the, but the essence of that universal truth that's in there is one of the most connecting pieces. And as you know, story is what connects us as humans since the beginning of time. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Have you ever videotaped your, because I've seen you in stand up doing your mm -hmm. thing and you are really good. You're yeah. <laughs> incredibly, um, you know, for the, for the person in the audience, you're just, you're riveted. Uh, have you ever videotaped any of your you know, I haven't. And that's been actually, it's literally staring at me on my whiteboard. Um, <laughs> I was like, and I'm, so I'm going to do some live video because there's an energy there that's different. Mm -hmm. But people have asked me to just get in front of a, of a video and make something fun with a fun background or whatever, and just recite some of my spoken word because some of my spoken word, other people have said is very healing for them to hear. Mm -hmm. And honestly, every time I recite it, it's healing for me as well. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So thanks for that. Thanks for that. The gods are on our, uh, the gods are in alignment with us. <laughs> yes. I love this story. <laughs> I, would say that. I love this story. <laughs> yeah, no, I do. I would do an audience though. 
uh, just because yes, of the, yes. there's so much give and take agreed, agreed. with, with you up there in the audience that, that to have that come through, I think would be extremely valuable. That's good to know. Actually, great. There, okay, cool. It's done. <laughs> That's right. I was going to say, I have this really catchphrase that has been with me for all my life. Like if someone tells me something fun, I go, I love this story. But I, I've just recently, like if someone tells me something, you know, some bad news, I've, I've been going, I don't like this story anymore. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I wish life was like that. I wish we could just say, you know, my car broke down. I don't like this story anymore. I think I'm just going to write it new and just jump in my car and it's going to work, you know? <laughs> that is a cool concept. Yeah. I love that. <laughs> maybe if everyone listening can embody that, it, maybe <laughs> maybe it would uh, create a shift. Well, oh. this has been so much fun and I, I really hope that it inspires people to yes. write their memoir. Yes. Now, you I have do. an upcoming live 30-day Facebook event. I do. I can't believe I'm doing it. <laughs> I can't either. I think it's awesome. <laughs> it's called Write With Me, mm -hmm. and it will be on my business page, which is Dawn Z. Manafusco, the memoir coach. If you just look up the memoir coach, you should find me. You could also find me through just the name Dawn Zigzag. You'll get my profile, and that should lead you to the page. And so every morning, Pacific time at 7 a.m., I'm going to go live on Facebook uh, for the whole month of November. November is National Novel Writing Month. Mm. We're not writing a novel, though. I mean, you could, but I'm going to encourage people that want to play with me and be, and be part of this interactive writing experience to focus on writing a true story and, and, and creative nonfiction or something that, that is true that they've wanted to write about for quite some time. And it doesn't have to be a book. We, you know, we could, in the 30 days, you could finish one essay, a few essays, or a few chapters of a book if you mm -hmm. want. Mm -hmm. um, some people might choose poetry as a, as a memoir uh, genre. You know, they might come out with lots of poems that month. I'm not, it's not, it's not strict to the genre, except for I would like people that joined. They'll get more out of it if they're there for memoir and true story and creative nonfiction. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to give a pep talk in the morning, go over, you know, a, a tip, a memoir tip. Uh, writing tip, um, how to get unstuck from writer's block, why it's hard to start, how we finish, why finishing is, is very important and strong, where to find the time, which is a big one, right? How do we find the time? I'm asking you write 15 minutes a day, maybe 30 minutes a day as a minimum, and you know see where that takes you. And then the whole idea is that if I'm up every morning at 7 a.m. and while you're getting ready for work, you can listen to it. That might help kickstart you to make a time later in the day to write, mm -hmm. or you can watch it later. It'll be recorded. Oh, I was going to ask that because I'm not up at seven, but yeah, I'm thinking. No, it'll be recorded <laughs> all day. So you can check in if you decide you want to do it later after dinner. Mm -hmm. um, and for those that don't have to be at work, you know, too early, they could write with me. Meaning mm -hmm. when I, I'm going to, when I sign off, I'll say, I'm going to write right now, everyone out there. I hope you've got your keyboards ready or however you want to write. And please do it for at least 15 minutes, you know, maybe 30. And then the idea is after, 30 days, as it gets further through the month, I'll be talking about finishing and editing and revising. Um, hopefully the pieces you've been working on or the piece you've been working on through that 30 days. Oh, and every day I'll be doing a Q and A. So at the end of my 15 minute pep talk and, you know, tip 15, 20 minutes, I'm going to do a Q and A and that will run as long as it needs to, or as short as it needs to, but probably not more than a half hour, 40 minutes. If there's lots of questions, I suspect for the first few you know, when you first do a Facebook Live, you don't get that many people right away until it, mm -hmm. you know, until it spreads that people are, are interested. But I'm so excited for that. I don't know. My spoken word stage presence, you know, part of me, granted, they won't, I, I could get on my, I could get like a fake audience or something or like, you know, print out heads behind me. But I think, <laughs> I, I think with Facebook Live, I'll just know there are people out there and that'll feel really good. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Uh, I think that's an awesome idea, and I I want to congratulate you really for having the guts to do it. Because yes. <laughs> for honestly, from from my perspective, well, just doing this podcast was scary because yeah. I didn't you know I didn't know anything about podcasts when it came into my head. I just liked listening to them, but doing something like this is it just seems like a, a an incredible commitment and oh yeah and putting yourself out there. Um, yeah. You are to be commended. <laughs> Thanks. You know, I'm doing it really because we do the things we need to learn the most. And I, after yep. this last summer and fall, my morning writing routine has been lagging. Mm -hmm. And so there's no greater way to make your routine stick than to tell everyone 
that you're going to be <laughs> live in the morning to write. And, you know, eventually I'll probably talk or write a little bit about that experience. You know, what was it like to, to show up every day for the right, for, for the muse, right? Mm -hmm. They say, you don't wait for the muse to inspire you to write. And I'll talk about this in the, the pod, uh, not the podcast, the Facebook mm -hmm. live mm -hmm. is you actually show up at your desk every single day and the muse will come and meet you. And I, that is, I've had that happen. It is one of the most powerful, amazing writing experiences because when you're consistent, not only what really is going on is your brain knows, oh, now's the time that I write and it opens up channels. And the more you do it, the more relaxed you get, the better you get like tennis or golf or anything. Mm -hmm. So that regular routine also triggers the mind and body to know, oh, now is when I get creative. So the muse meets me every morning. Once it knows I'm serious, ah, the muse mm -hmm. wants to know that you're, that you're, you're going to take your writing seriously to some degree. Mm -hmm. you know? So yeah, I'm excited, but I'm nervous. I'm sure like at least one or two of them, I'll be in my pajamas, but you know. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> That'll be the fun part, you know. <laughs> That's what I always liked about coaching over the phone half the yeah. time you're in, you're in your pajamas. I'll never forget once I was I was coaching this one woman and I was in bed and my two schnauzers were on the bed oh with me God. and I had the guts to say something. A lot of yeah. times I wouldn't. And she was in bed in her pajamas. We ah, laughed so yeah, hard. Yeah. <laughs> I, I've, I've been guilty of that and so has my clients. Usually, though, I, I mean, I've just been, a, I'm working with a new coach, a uh, business coach, and I've really been adopting the get dressed for work model when you're working by yourself for so long, because, mm -hmm. you know, you really, it feels good. It just feels good to feel like you're getting, but there is definitely those times. Oh, well, <laughs> but you know, if you're used to dressing up all the time, I don't know how many people I've had conversations with on this podcast who have been so grateful that we're not doing video. And they're like, can I be in, does that mean I can be in my PJs? And I'm like, That's yes, you can. Cute. You be I'm as comfortable I'm and relaxed as you, as you can. <laughs> Yeah, the, there's benefits everywhere. See, not, nothing. There's no more boundaries. We don't have to worry about anything stopping us from from being amazing. No, we don't have to worry about. <laughs> you know what? And that's scary because yeah, because there's no excuses. <laughs> yes, it's true. Oh, except, good point. You know, except us. <laughs> yep. No, um, I got it. I love mm -hmm, it. Mm -hmm. Well, I wish you all the best on your 30 days. So it's 30 days, starting November. First, right, so it's the the whole month of November. You're going to be doing this, and um, it's seven seven in the morning Pacific. Mm -hmm. So that is ten seven to eight to nine. To, yeah, ten on the East Coast. Um, uh -huh. uh, just for people who, um, since my family still lives uh, in Eastern Time, I'm pretty good at figuring that out. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard I don't know how many times I think of calling my sister and I go oh shit it's 11 o'clock there oh, oh I can't God. do it you know or totally. you know yeah it's just um that three hours makes such a huge difference it's pretty funny yeah <laughs> <laughs> so and uh we will have some I plan on having another discussion with you in the future um because you have a lot of talents and you're very creative also her live uh Facebook program is video and zigzag is very cute. She's very animated. <laughs> and so even if you aren't sure you want to write, you should check it out because I have no doubt that it's going to be a lot of fun. Oh, that's great. And I forgot to mention, I, I will give you a link. I have a PDF gift and basically it's seven memoir prompts to overcome fear mm. and discover joy in writing about your past. Nice. So, yeah, so I, I, it's a, it's just a PDF of some really cool ideas that people don't usually think about that mm -hmm. helps people really find the joy about writing about maybe some difficult stuff. So I will include this to you. I will give this to you and you can just maybe oh, link. Oh, thank you. Yeah. yeah. So it'll be on the webpage yeah. at www.realjanine.com. J-A-N-E-A-N. -E I always have to spell it. Yes. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so there will be a link to this uh, free PDF. And what was the title of it again, hon? It's called Seven Memoir Prompts to Overcome Fear and Discover Joy in Writing About Your Past. Great. Thank you. At the website, you can also uh, sign up for our mail list. And there's a box where you can sign up for the realjanine.com mail list for keeping it real. And I will send you notices of when there's something, a new podcast coming out or 
anything that I think is super important. It won't be, um, uh, what's the word I won't, it, you know, I won't just send out an email that's, that I don't think is important. You're not going to spam anybody. <laughs> I'm not going to spam anybody. Thank Great. you. Zigzag's much better at marketing than I am. So <laughs> I, 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 I think I'm going to need her as my marketing mentor. Um, and I bet, I bet out there there's at least everyone who's listening right now knows one person who could benefit from your podcast. Cause I always listen and think, oh my gosh, I know someone who has adrenal fatigue or I know someone that needs to learn more about cannabis and how and the health benefits of that or I know someone who wants to write a memoir you know so so people who are listening I'm sure they they know at least one person that would benefit from your from your podcast oh thank you and I can tell from what you just said that you actually do listen yeah <laughs> <laughs> and also you can subscribe on iTunes too oh that's um, right so yeah so keeping it real with Janine uh, type that in and uh, the podcast will come up and you can subscribe and you can write a review and rate, which would be really wonderful. I would appreciate it. So thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Dawn. Thank you. This it's has so been great. a lot of fun. Yeah. And take care, everyone, and be well. Bye.